Hello everyone, today we'll be discussing abnormalities of the purpurium. So we'll start with purpural pyraxia, which is defined as a rise of temperature reaching 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius or more measured orally on two separate occasions at 24 hours apart. So this needs to exclude the first 24 hours within the first 10 days following delivery. It's called purpural pyraxia. So when you look at this, we talk about so there will be a raised temperature above 38 degrees Celsius need to, measure, to be measured on two separate occasions and does not count the first 24 hours post delivery. It needs to be within the first days of delivery. So that's what we call purpural pyrexia. So the causes of pyrexia include one purpural sepsis, two UTIs, such as cystitis or pyelonephritis, three mastitis, four infection of the caesarean section wound, five pulmonary infection, a telectasis pneumonia, six septic pelvic thrombophlebitis, seven a recrudescence of malaria or pulmonary TB, which is not uncommon in the tropics. Eight, it can be of unknown origin. It's like whereby the above causes have been ruled out, but the patient still has purpural pyrexia. Then we have purpural sepsis, which is defined as an infection of the genital tract, which occurs as a complication of delivery. Then purpural pyrexia is considered to be due to genital tract infection unless proved otherwise. Purpural sepsis is commonly due to 1. Endometritis, 2. Endomyometritis, 3. Endoparametritis. The combination of all this is called pelvic cellulitis. So basically, either it can just affect the endometrium, which we call endometritis, can, inf can affect the endometrium and myometrium, which we call endomyometritis, or it can affect all three layers of the uterus, which we call endoparametritis. Predisposing factors of purpural sepsis, so the pathogenicity of the vaginal flora may be influenced by certain factors. 1. The cervical vaginal mucous membrane is damaged even in normal delivery. 2. The uterine surface too, especially the placental site, is converted into an open wound by the cleavage of the decidua which takes place during the third stage of labor. And three, the blood clots that are present at the placental site are excellent media for the growth of the bacteria. So basically, they are trying to explain what are the predisposing factors of peripheral sepsis. One we are told is that even after normal delivery, the cervical vaginal mucous membrane is damaged, right? Two, even the uterine surface is damaged. So what are they talking about? Where the placenta is attached to the uterus. So that area after detachment, is an open wound is created. So that's where infection can set in and as well as you know that there are blood clots that are present at the placental site. So those are excellent media for the growth of bacteria. What are antipartum factors? So that is malnutrition and anemia, preterm labor, premature rupture of the membranes, chronic debilitating illness, prolonged rupture of membranes of more than 18 hours. Intrapartum factors include repeated vaginal examinations, prolonged rupture of the membranes of more than 18 hours, dehydration and ketoacidosis during labor, traumatic operative delivery, hemorrhage which may be antipartum or postpartum, retained bits of placental tissue or membranes, placenta previa, whereby the placental site is lying close to the vagina, aid caesarean delivery. So due to the factors mentioned above, the organisms gain foothold, Either in the traumatized tissues of the uterovaginal canal or in the raw decidua that is left behind or in the blood clot, especially at the placental site. Mode of infection. So, peripheral sepsis is, a, is essentially a wound infection. Placental site, which is being a raw surface, lacerations of the genital tract or caesarean section wounds may be infected in the following ways. So, sources of infection may be endogenous, where organisms are present in the genital tract before delivery. Or it may be exogenous, where infection is contracted from sources outside the patient, such as from hospital or attendants. Pathology. So the primary sites of infection are 1. Perineum, 2. Vagina, 3. Cervix, and 4. The uterus. Clinical features. So they are classified according to local infection, uterine infection, and spreading infection. So when we look at local infection, which is infection of a wound, so of note, there will be, there'll be a slight rise of temperature, generalized malaise or headache. 
Two, the local wound becomes red and swollen. The repulse may form, which leads to disruption of the wound. When severe acute, there is high rise of temperature with chills and rigor. The nutrient infection, if it's mild, there is a rise in temperature and pulse rate. Two, local discharge becomes offensive and copious. Three, the uterus is subinvoluted and tender. If it's severe, the onset is acute with a high rise of temperature, often presents with chills and rigor. Two, pulse rate is rapid, out of proportion to temperature. So we know that if temperature raises by 1 degree, there is a rise in heart rate of about 10 beats per minute. So in this one, the, the heart rate will be so rapid that it won't match with the temperature. Lochia may be scanty and odorless, for uterus may be subinvoluted, tender and softer. There may be associated wound in fascia of the perineum, vagina or the cervix. So how do you investigate puerperal pyrexia? The underlying principles in investigations are 1. To locate the site of infection 2. To identify the organisms 3. To assess the severity of the disease A case of puerperal pyrexia is considered to be due to genital sepsis unless it's proved otherwise. The investigation should also be directed to find out any extragenital source of infection to account for the fever as well. So the investigations of puerperal pyrexia. So in history, you look at the antenatal, intranatal and postnatal history of any high risk factor of infection like anemia, prolonged rupture of membranes or prolonged labor to be taken note of. Clinical examination includes thorough general, physical and systemic examinations. Abdominal and pelvic examinations are done to note the evaluation of genital organs and locate the specific site of infection. The legs should be examined for thrombophlebitis or thrombosis. Investigations include high vaginal and endocervical swab for microscopic culture and sensitivity, a clean catch midstream specimen of urine for microscopic culture and sensitivity, blood for total and differential white cell count, hemoglobin estimation, a low platelet count may indicate septicemia or disseminated intravascular coagulation. Thick blood film should also be examined for malarial parasites for blood culture if fever is associated with chills and rigor. Other specific investigations as per the clinical condition are needed. Pelvic ultrasound is helpful one to detect any retained bits of conception within the uterus, two to locate any abscess with the pelvis through collecting samples pus or fluid from the pelvis for culture and sensitivity and for color flow doppler study to detect venous thrombosis. Six extra of the chest should be taken in cases with suspected pulmonary cord lesion and also to detect any lung pathology like collapse and atelectasis following inhalation anesthesia. Seven blood urea and electrolytes may be done in a selected case. To have a baseline record in the event that renal failure develops later in the course of the disease or a laparotomy is needed. So the treatment is general care includes 1. Isolation of the patient is preferred, especially when hemolytic streptococcus is obtained on culture. However, of notice this is not commonly done. 2. Adequate fluid and calorie is maintained by intravenous infusion. 3. Anemia is corrected by oral iron or if needed by blood transfusion. However, commonly we don't usually give iron in anemia when we're suspecting puerperal sepsis. Why? Because we believe that iron is a source of bacterial proliferation. So commonly we just give folic acid and then after the infection resolves, then we start giving iron supplements. For an indwelling catheter is used to relieve any urine retention due to pelvic abscess and it also helps to record urinary output. 5. A chart is maintained by recording pulse respiration, temperature, local discharge and fluid intake and output. So of note is the antibiotics. So ideal antibiotic regimen should depend on the culture and sensitivity report. However, we know that we don't get the culture and sensitivity report immediately. So as you're pending the report, you can start with gentamicin at 2 mg per kg IV, loading dose followed by 1.5 mg per kg IV every 8 hours, and ampicillin 1 gram IV every 6 hours, or clindamycin 900 mg IV every 8 hours should be started. So of note is basically with gentamicin, you're taking 
You are targeting the gram-negative organisms and ampicillin is targeting the gram-positive organisms. Intravenous administration of cefotaxim 1 gram 8 hourly is another alternative. Metronidazole 0.5 grams or 500 milligrams IV is given at 8 hours interval to control the anaerobic group. The treatment is continued until the infection is controlled for at least 7 to 10 days. Surgical treatment. So there is little role of major surgery in the treatment of peripheral sepsis. Perineal wound. The stitches of the perineal wound may have to be removed to facilitate drainage of pus and relieve pain. The wound is to be cleaned with seat spots several times a day and is dressed with an antiseptic ointment or powder. After the infection is controlled, secondary suture may be given at a later date. Retain uterine products with a diameter of 3 cm or less may be disregarded and left alone. Otherwise, surgical evacuation after antibiotic coverage for 24 hours should be done to avoid the risk of septicemia. If this wound dehiscence, the dehiscence of episiotomy or abdominal wound following caesarean section is managed by scrubbing the wound twice daily, debridement of all necrotic tissue and then closing the wound with secondary suture. Appropriate antimicrobials are used following culture and sensitivity. Laparotomy generally has got limited indications, however, if there is unresponsive peritonitis, a lap is indicated. If no palpable pathology is found, drainage of pus may be effective. Management of bacteremic of septic shock includes fluid and electrolyte balance to monitor central venous pressure, respiratory support so you maintain arterial partial pressure of oxygen and partial pressure of carbon dioxide, circulatory support if the patient is hypotensive and not responsive to fluids, you can give ionotropic support <coughs> using dopamine or dobutamine. Then infection control, intensive antibiotic therapy, surgical removal of septic foci, and specific management, such as if there is renal failure, so you can under, they can undergo hemodialysis. So that's all about preparal sepsis.